A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. The 11 Olympic team members slain in West Germany. The Olympic Games... Look at how it's found a breeder in America. So how to shop it at the ski town. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in heaven. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Russia. It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, Yehuda Geber. Welcome, everyone, to Jewish History Soundbites. This is Yehuda Geber with another episode of Jewish History Soundbites. And on our Malava Malka episode tonight, we have the yard site tonight of Rav Yitzchak Yaakov Reines, the uh, famed rabbi of the town of Lida. And he was a Rosh Hashiva, he was the founder of the Mizrahi, there's a lot to talk about him. Um, we'll try to focus more on his yeshiva, we spoke a little bit about his his uh, his um, political uh, ideas in our Rabbis and Zionist series. So we'll focus more on his rabbinic career and uh, his early life and his yeshiva. A lot of an interesting story here. So, we... Um, just want to put out there that, um, again, before we start, that there are uh, episodes that are available for sponsorship. So just be in touch with me uh, in regards to sponsorship as well. Um, if we uh, talk about the situation of the Jews in, especially in Eastern Europe and the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century, they were faced with a with a new situation and almost an impossible situation. The modern times had brought new ideas and trends of modernity and the Enlightenment and the Ascala and all kinds of things that was just causing a major upheaval, everything together, technological advances that really posed a completely new situation to Jewish leaders, to rabbinical leaders, to de- how to deal with the the new reality of modern times, um, with all the factors that had brought it to that new reality. And there was really diff- th- three different possibilities about what to do, and we can really um, say it over with a mushal I once heard from Rabbi Wine, or Beryl Wine, that uh, you have a, a doctor and a disease, and the new disease that no one has ever seen or discovered and no one knows any treatment for, and the doctor is faced with what to do with the patient with this brand new disease where he knows that none of the treatments, none of the medicine, none of the amazing, vast medical knowledge that he has, in none of the medicines he knows about, nothing that modern science has can treat this new disease. So he has three choices what to do with this patient who's going to just get sicker and perhaps even pass away if he doesn't do anything. So option number one is to do nothing, uh, because since since the doctor can't help him, so he's not going to just uh, pretend to treat him, he can't do anything, there's nothing to do, so that's it. And the second option is to do all the regular things that he does, prescribe all the regular medicines that he, that he prescribes, uh, that he does for other diseases, for other sicknesses, that he knows will not help for this new manifestation for this new expression, this new disease, but and he knows it won't work, but he's doing it anyway because I have to do something for my patient. I can't just let him die in front of my eyes. And the third option is to try some experimental medicine, knowing that that it might make things worse, it might not do anything, might not have any effect, 
It might actually make him better. Perhaps it's experimental. We don't know what it's going to do. That's really the three choices that the doctor has. And that's the three choices that were made by Jewish and rabbinical leaders uh, at that time, um, not, both in Eastern and Western Europe, uh, about what to do about the new situation of modern times that it presented, the challenge, the unique challenges that it presented. Some, most, we would say, most uh, opted for the first two, either not to do anything or to do the same thing, knowing it won't work. And there were some who uh, tried, some, some courageously, some uh, uh, any attempt to do something new despite the risks. People like Rav Shamshin Rafael Hirsch in, in Germany, people like Rav Yisrael Salanter with the Muslim movement, Sarah Shanir in the 20th century. To a certain extent, there were Hasidic leaders like the Piazetzner Rebbe who within Hasidus tried to come up with innovative ideas. It's also an interesting topic. One of the ones who, more than almost anyone else, who was willing to risk and try new ideas was Rev. Rhinus, Rev. Yitzhak Yaakov Rhinus, despite the risks involved and despite uh, very often opposition. He grew up in Karlin, and uh, Karlin is you know, a suburb of Pinsk, was a very Hasidic town, but also a very Litvish town. It was in the middle of Lithuania, middle of white Russia, Belarus. And his last name, Rhinus, comes from the, the woman's name, Rhina, in the possessive sense, Rhinus. So he had an ancestor, I think is his grandmother, great-grandmother perhaps, um, whose name was Rhina, and she helped her husband. She supported her husband in his study of Torah, and therefore... She, her husband, her family was all belonged to her. It was in her merit. It was in her support. So the family name became Rhinus. And that's uh, that's what remained um, down to his generation. So he went to study in Valozhin uh, at a very young age, which was common in those days. He was about 15, 16 years old. And he learned in Valozhin for a couple of years. He then went on to learn in, in Aishishuk, which was also... A, a, a center of Tyra, a city of Tyra, where there was a kibbutz, where there was a, a lot of people in the Beis Medrash and Aishashuk would learn together. It was like an informal yeshiva, but it was quite famous throughout Lithuania as a center. The Chavetz Chaim was later on affiliated with there also. Either way, so he was um, close with the Nitziv in Valazhin, and uh, he eventually went back to Karlin, he gets married, he has smicha to become a, a rabbi, and then he becomes the rabbi. One of the one of the first uh, places he becomes a rabbi is in Shvinsian, a small little shtetl. In fact, I once met a, a survivor who grew up in Shvinsian, and I asked him, uh, "What is? What can he tell me? What, can, what does he remember about Shvinsian?" And he goes on to describe. He's actually a very accomplished individual. He, Historian, he had written books. He was he had served in the Palmach and the Israeli army, and a very, very impressive individual. Had accomplished much in his life as a partisan during the war. Either way, so he um, he told me that after all that, after all that he had, he had living in Tel Aviv in his nineties uh, at the time when I spoke to him, uh, he he described the uh, the quaint life of the shtetl, the uh, how everyone knew each other and everyone cared for each other. And again, uh, you know, we have a tendency to either get wax nostalgic about the shtetl and the style of Shalom Aleichem or to emphasize how hard everything was in the shtetl. Everyone was poor and everyone was illiterate and it was terrible and it was... So it's probably somewhere in the middle. It's not black and white, but this was his memories and this is the way he was describing it about this really beautiful um, uh, Heimish... A uh, certain type of lifestyle, and he said he misses it. That was the cutest thing about it. He told me he still misses Shvinsian till today. Either way, so he, uh, Sir of Rhinus, his first attempt at opening a yeshiva was in Shvinsian, and he he was faced with with the problems uh, and the struggles of the both the rabbinate and education in Chinuch for the next generation. Um, on one hand, he saw that the the youth of his day. They desired a secular education, many of them. That was the modern times. And the only way to get it was to go to the gymnasium 
was to go outside of the regular framework because Jewish education didn't normative Jewish education did not offer such a such a uh, an alternative. On the other hand, he saw the issues that was facing the rabbinate at the time. Number one, there was the long time issue in the Russian Empire of the crown rabbis, the Rav Mitam, that since the rabbis had to know Russian. They had to be certified by the Russian government. So every single, almost every single rabbi in the Russian Empire was not an official legal rabbi. The, the, towns, the townspeople had to hire them on their own. There was The official government recognized rabbi was just an official, a bureaucrat. He was not a rabbi at all. He just register, registered the births and the deaths and the marriages in the community. And the Russian government considered him the rabbi, but he was usually... He was not. He was just, uh, you know, an office bureaucrat. So this, here, the town had to support two rabbis: the real rabbi and the crown rabbi. And it was a, it was a major issue, and it was also an expense, an added expense, and it caused all types of sorts of other problems. He felt that also the rabbinate needed a refreshing in modern times to be able to relate to the new generation, to be able to relate to the youth, to be able to be um, more relevant and more influential. Uh, than they than they uh, than they were, so his idea, which this would essentially solve both problems, would be to start a yeshiva that would combine secular studies. So the secular studies that would be emphasized would be the ones that were needed. They would, they would study the Russian language so that the that the rabbanim who are produced in this yeshiva, and it was a yeshiva that was geared towards producing rabbis, like most other yeshivas at the time. And he, so they would know Russian, they would know basic uh, secular studies, and it would also uh, somewhat satiate the appetite of the youth to have that exposure, and it would be within the framework of yeshiva, it would protect them from the outside influences, they wouldn't have to go to the gymnasium, and they would be able to become uh, real rabbis, and this would, this would solve all the, uh, all the issues. Um, there was tremendous opposition to this, to this plan, to this idea, and he proposed it to other rabbanim in a meeting in St. Petersburg, and uh, you know, to bring secular studies into the yeshiva was a very controversial issue. He also faced opposition from other venues, from the Haskala, from the Maskilim, leading leaders of the Enlightenment. They saw this, a type of yeshiva as this as a threat, because now they would not go to the gymnasium, they would not go to the you know, this would this would keep the youth inside the yeshiva. This would keep the youth inside traditional Judaism. Uh, then they would this would be a problem. So they also were not happy with it. So he got it from both sides, and the Russian government got involved. And he wasn't licensed like all the other yeshivas at the time. But they made an issue for him because this this yeshiva made it onto the radar because of the all the opposition, especially because um, of the of the uh, latter the maskilim. They did not want a uh, yeshiva like that to exist, so they, I think they, they uh, might have even even uh, gotten the Russian government involved. Either way, what's interesting is that the Sfarim that he had published until that time were actually popular with the uh, Maskilim, the Askal. He had a very new and unique Derech Halimud, his style of learning, his style of thinking, the way he learned, the way he taught, um, was with a lot of use of, of modern methodology like logic and mathematics, and he incorporated a lot of that into his study of Gemara, and his Sfarim are full of it, and the way he would give over Torah and his yeshiva to his Talmidim was very much in that style. So he, he uh, and, that, and, that, and that was like a certain uh, modern outlook in education and modern outlook in writing, and, uh, and uh, that evidently was popular, but uh, the yeshiva was forced to close down. So, the the um, he eventually leaves Shvinsian and he becomes the rabbi in Lida. Lida was a much bigger town. Lida, Lida was a town of ten thousand Jews. It's a it's a very central area near Raden and Jetel, Lavardek, Branovich, The area all in Belarus. So we've been there quite a few times on tours, and now of course there's no tours. Now we're doing uh, virtual tours and lectures that you could also be in touch with me about. But when we once upon a time when we did tours, that so if you've been hopefully again soon, um, there was uh, he 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 became so he becomes the rub of this larger, much larger city, and uh, there he faces quite a few challenges. The city, most of the town, burned down, 
He had a son who passed away very young, also it was a very tragic. Uh, he lost all of his sfarim, his library, in, in this fire. And he actually went to England to fundraise in 1891, one of the first rabbis or Rashi Yeshiva to travel abroad to, you know, not exactly the United States, but it's all the way to England in 1891 to fundraise. And while he was there, he was taken up as a rabbi in Manchester for a very short period of time, just a couple of months. I think it was two or three months. And it didn't work out, and he was able to fundraise a little bit. So he goes back to Lida. And he comes back to Lida. He decides eventually to open a yeshiva. Now this time was attempt number two to open the yeshiva that would have secular studies. The name of this yeshiva would be Torah Vadas, and the reason it would be called Torah Vadas would be because it's Taira, but it's also Das. It's also going to incorporate uh, um, secular studies with the same goals that he had in mind as as, as previously. Now, the yeshiva Torah Vadas in the United States was named for it because it had closed down during World War One, which we'll get to. He passed away in 1915 during World War One, and and the yeshiva didn't really survive the war. So it kind of closed down during the during World War One, and the yeshiva Tarvadas in in America was named for Rev. Rhinus's yeshiva because it also incorporated uh, secular studies um, as well. But I think we spoke about that in a long time ago in the uh, series that we had on the history of yeshiva Tarvadas. So you could check that out uh, as well. So he opens up the yeshiva. The yeshiva grows, and actually this time it was successful and. At its peak, an incredible 300 students in the yeshiva. He also had a koilo connected to the yeshiva. Senior division, lower division, and, and he brought in the great Rosh Yeshiva, who was very young at the time, the Meichater Eli, or Shalem Apaliachik, who was the Rosh Yeshiva for almost the entire time of the yeshiva's existence. And um, he had a yeshiva, uh, Mashgiach, also a very prestigious individual, Rabbi Leo Doiv Berkovsky, who was a Meshgiach previously in neighboring Navardic, in the Navardic yeshiva, who was very close also with the, the Aruch HaShulchan, Rabbi Chil Nechul Epstein, Sir Basilio, Dov Berkovsky was the Meshgiach there in, in Navardic, and later on he moves on to uh, to become the Meshgiach in Lida. He's someone who eventually moved to, uh, to Eretz Yisrael. He was involved with the first yeshiva in Tel Aviv, a whole, a whole story also, also an impressive uh, individual. See, either way, the Lida yeshiva, he... He had a he had first of all he had this unique derech halim which I mentioned, and then he had secular studies, Russian and, and and certain sciences, and then even within the within the within uh, the Torah subjects he added unique what was unique for the time like Tanakh, he had a certain amount of the shiurim that were given in the yeshiva would be in the Hebrew language. He was also the first yeshiva. He was a, a trailblazer in this yeshiva in many many respects. He wanted to train these future rabbis in public speaking. They should know how to write. They should know how to speak. They should know Hebrew. They should know Tanakh. They should also know, like I said, secular studies. So it was like a real, real holistic uh, approach to education and to Yeshiva Chinuch, which was completely revolutionary at the time. Again, it engendered a tremendous amount of controversy. Uh, many, many went against it. The Chavetz Chaim pleaded with him, who was nearby in Raden to close it, to not do it, to not go ahead with it. And Chavetz Chaim was very opposed to the yeshiva. And, uh, and, and in fact, when there was a boy, I don't know if it happened once or it happened several times, but it became a legend in Raden that if a boy was expelled by the administration of Raden from the yeshiva there, then all he had to do, and I think this happened at least on one occasion, that to go to the Chavetz Chaim to inform him that the yeshiva administration had an, had expelled him from the yeshiva, and to say, you know what, since I was expelled from Radin, so I'll just go over to Lida, right nearby, and I'll go to that yeshiva. And immediately the Chavetz Chaim said, oh, you're going to go to Lida, so stay, I'll make sure that you get back into the yeshiva. We shouldn't, chas v'shalom, have someone going to the Lida yeshiva where he's going to be exposed to have a, be in a yeshiva with secular studies. Lida was the nearby town because it had a train station. It was the closest train station to Radin, so it was very uh, closely affiliated. So that's that's um, that was the yeshiva. So it grew, and in fact, he it was, it was not the only Torah institution that he was involved. With. First of all, when he opened the yeshiva in Shvinsian, the first round, the when, way he got funding for the yeshiva originally was from the famous German donor 
Ovadia Lachman was an incredible individual, but what he supported, the Torah that he supported in Eastern Europe, and interesting personality, and what his whole story was, and how much he supported, which institutions he supported, the, I mean, a lot of the Musa yeshivas, he also supported Shvinsian in those early years, and it was during those early years when uh, Rev. Reinus was in Shvinsian, and later on in his early years in Lida, that he was involved in the founding of the what well, became the Kovna Koil. There's a lot of people who were involved in the founding of the Kovna Koil. He was one of the initiators of the idea of the Kovna Koil, and that was also together with Avad Lachman, which should also fit into Rav Reines's general goals of trying to fix the rabbinate in Russia. So if we would have a prestigious Koil, which would accept the best and brightest from all over Russia, that would definitely also enhance the stature of the Talmud Chacham and the future rabbis in, uh, uh, in Russia. Now he was... Despite all the controversy that he generated, he was a very a tremendous Talmud Chacham and very well respected amongst the rabbinate, uh, even by those who opposed his ideas. You talk about someone, it's interesting, it seems that even that, that first round of the Yeshiva in Sian, it seems that his Rebbe the Nitziv uh, supported uh, the idea that he should that he should start that Yeshiva. Um, so it did come with a certain element of, of support from the leaders of the day, but uh, it it had had a lot more controversy than uh, than support his his ideas that one and later on in Lida, what he's also famous for, and usually that's the only thing they speak about when he's there's been a lot spoken about him and there's been a lot written about him. But usually the focus is on on his founding of the Mizrahi. Rav Reines, he joined with the Zionist movement when it began, and he uh, extracted a promise from. Uh, from Herzl, seems from Herzl itself. One one source I saw said it was from Achad Ha'am, which came a little later, but that uh, that 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 he would the 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 uh, the, the the promise that he was able to um, extract was that Jewish traditional education and chinuch would stay in the hands of the religious, would stay in the hands of the rabbis, and on that condition he joined. Zionist movement, which was a promise that was never kept, but um, he believed in the program, the Zionist program, not for any messianic reasons. Messianic Zionism came later, but it was because he, as a leading rabbi in the Russian Empire, and this is something that we covered in the Rabbis and the Zionist series, he saw the tremendous problems facing Russian Jewry at the time, the poverty, the pogroms, the immigration to the United States, which was leading to secularization and eventually assimilation. He couldn't keep Shabbos. So let's create a Jewish religious society in the land of Israel where it will be easier and we'll be away from the czar. We won't have the secularization of the United States. And this will kind of solve all the problems, which is why he voted for the Uganda plan at the, at the 1903 Sixth Zionist uh, Congress. It was because, you know, if we can get to the land of Israel, so at least we'll have a temporary solution in Uganda, but at least we'll get away from the czar. And we won't have to have the secularization in America. So that was, he was, it was very practical and pragmatic and also a leader. He cared for the, uh, you know, not living in the clouds, uh, but he cared for the needs of his people. He did not like politics. He hated politics. He was uh, more wanted to be a rabbinical leader and a Rosh Yeshiva. So he, when, when the Mizrahi became officially a political movement and became more and more involved in politics, especially after he sustained all the Mizrahi's uh, program, was defeated by the Eastern European Zionists, by a series of Zionist congresses, by Achad Ha'am and, and uh, Asher Ginsburg, Achad Ha'am and all his uh, cohorts when they promoted the kultura, the culture, that the, the Zionism has to not just be about political Zionism, it has to be a revamping the Jewish people culturally and uh, spiritually, and we have to create the new Jew and get rid of all the baggage of the exile. So they defeated the entire Mizrahi uh, program and uh, promoted um, the culture program and Tarbut. And uh, he was disillusioned from that a bit, and he also did not like the whole political party situation. In 1909, he actually left his active involvement in the Mizrahi and left it to the next generation of Yudalei Fishman and Mayor Barilan and Zev Yaivitz, the historian, and others. 
So he, he was uh, less involved at the end of his life. During World War I, the yeshiva goes into exile. Like most other yeshivas, he did not go into exile with them. He passed away relatively in the early part of the war and is buried in Lida. We lost his, uh, his, his grave site when the cemetery was destroyed during the Second World War. But the yeshiva kind of collapsed. He was the, he was the uh, force of the yeshiva. He was the charisma. He was a very tremendous personality. And his son tried to continue it for another few years, but it didn't quite work out. So the yeshiva kind of fell apart at that point. So this was a little bit about Rav Reines. This is Yehuda Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudaGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, lectures, sponsorships. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on Podbean, follow us on Twitter at JSoundbites, and I hope you enjoyed.